Okay, this video is going to cover um, all the different style of questions that could come up on your prelim in January. Um, it will be quite a long video, um, so if you look in the um, information for this video down below, I will be putting in timestamps so that you can move between the inorganic, the physical, the organic and the problem solving uh, style questions. There are no open-ended questions in this video. You'll be given a separate booklet for that. And by no means is this a complete um, video on every single type of question you could get. This is covering the majority of the content and the key skills and subject areas you need to know. So with that said, let's get started. So these questions are all gonna be on inorganic chemistry. Um, First one, so we have got a, an emission spectrum and we've been asked what does each line represent. Now in an emission spectrum, remember you emit light whenever you are an electron that is falling down. That's when you give off energy, which is that. So if you are emitting, you are dropping down. So it's not representing an energy level. Electron moving to a higher energy level, no, that would be adsorption. Lies within the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Well, look at these wavelengths. All these wavelengths are under 380. Which on your colour wheel, remember, on page 19 of your data booklet, and the colour wheel shows all the wavelengths for coloured light, and the lowest one is 380. These are below, so all of these are UV. Falling to a lower level, that is your correct answer there. If it was an absorption spectrum, it would be moving to it, and remember, when you're moving upwards, you're going to be called an excited electron. Emission is when an excited electron falls from a higher to a lower energy level. So this question is about coordination number. Coordination number is the number of dative covalent bonds on the metal. So what we need to do is we need to look at the ligands and work out whether they are monodentate, bidentate. Monodentate forming one bond, bidentate forming two bonds. Well, we've got ammonia, those are mono, and we've got four of them, so that's going to be four bonds from there. We've got water. Water is also monodentate, and there's two of them, so that's two bonds, so in total that gives us a coordination number of six. Right, our next question is about Hunt's rule. You're going to need to know Hunt's rule, the Aufbau principle and the Pauli exclusion principle. Hunt's rule is the one about degenerate orbitals. So Hunt's rule is that first one. Electrons occupy degenerate orbitals singly before pairing up. So the answer to this one is A. Next question, the Pauli exclusion principle. Now, the Pauli exclusion principle is the one that tells you about the fact that no two electrons um, can have the same four quantum numbers, and that if two electrons are in the same orbital, they must have opposite spins. So in this one, it means no two electrons can have the same set of four quantum numbers. Good. The alternative one being is, alternative definition would be if you have two electrons in the same orbital, they must have opposite spins. But no two electrons can have the same quantum numbers as the, um, the other definition. So speaking of quantum numbers, we are looking at magnesium two plus ions in this question. And the magnesium two plus ion, go to your electron arrangement page in your data booklet if you do not know. Um, Magnesium, so page eight is where you would find the electron arrangements in the data booklet. 
And when magnesium is a 2 plus ion, uh, so magnesium atom is 2, 8, 2, but magnesium as a 2 plus is 2, 8, which is equivalent to neon. So what this question is asking you is what four quantum numbers could represent the um, an electron in the outer shell of neon. So neon is in the second period. So neon is in the second period. So we can immediately eliminate D because if it's in the second period, it's got a principal quantum number of two. Neon is in the P block, which means it needs to have an um, angular momentum quantum number of one. So B can be eliminated. Now, if you have an angular momentum of one, if L equals one, ML can equal minus one, zero, or plus one. Those are your only options. So this here, that minus two, that cannot happen. So we would eliminate A. Minus one works and plus a half is reasonable for an electron. So our answer to this one is C. This next question is about VSEPR, the shapes of molecules. So from this, this is not the nicest one drawn, but what we are looking for here is we have got four bonds and two non-bonding. So every single one of these molecules has four bonds in it. So what we need to work out is in total, do we have six pairs of electrons? So you will need to look at your data booklet for this. Where is the central atom in each one? And then work out the number of electrons. So with sulfur, sulfur is in group six. So it's got six electrons plus four from the four fluorines. That gives you 10 which is five pairs. So that cannot work. Your NH4 plus, well, nitrogen has five. Five plus your four, you've got a positive charge. So that's negative one, because you add on one for every negative charge. You take away one for every positive charge. That gives us eight. So that's going to have four pairs. So that one's not going to work. Xenon, well, xenon is a noble gas, so it has got eight in its outer shell, plus four, a no charge. Well, that is 12, so that is six pairs. So this one can work. And our bottom one, aluminium, well, aluminium has three, plus four, plus one for the negative charge. That gives us eight, so that one is four pairs. So the only one that can have that arrangement of six with four bonding and two non-bonding is that xenon tetrafluoride. Right, the next question here is naming a complex or both from a name working out the complex. So the first thing I'm gonna do is actually, I'm gonna look at the ending. So it's copper two. Now copper name is copper, it's not cuprate. Cuprate would be used if the complex had a negative charge. So because it's copper, we can eliminate A because of that negative charge. It's copper two, which means that copper is two plus. Now what we've got is tetraamine, so that's four ammonia, to chlorine. Now this is an old question. In a new question that should be chloride rather than chloro. Now every single one of these has four ammonia and has two chlorines. So what we're going to need to do is work out the charges coming from the ammonia and coming from the chlorine 
And then because we know that copper is two plus, what charge should this complex have? Well, NH3 is neutral, so it has no charge. Chloride ligands are negative, and we've got two of them, so that means they are negative two. We've only got one copper, so negative two plus two means we've got a charge of zero. So our complex should be neutral, which gives us B as our answer. Okay, so look at the end. That's going to tell you the charge on your metal. The name of the metal is also going to tell you whether or not the complex overall has a negative or positive charge. In this one, we are looking at oxidation states and we're looking for which metal has the highest oxidation state. Well, the first one that we can easily work out is tin. It has an oxidation state of plus four because that's the only thing we've got. In all of the other ones, we have got oxygen and oxygen is always negative two. So for our top one, we've got two chromium plus seven oxygen adds up to negative two. Now that seven oxygen, that's going to be minus 14, equals minus two. So our two chromium is going to be 12, and we take that negative over. Sorry, fell in the equation. So chromium is going to equal six. Um, our MnO4 minus, well, that is manganese plus four oxygen equals minus one. Manganese minus eight equals minus one. So manganese equals plus seven. So that's, what, that's the one in the lead. Over here, I'm going to do vanadium. So vanadium plus oxygen equals minus, oh, plus two, sorry. So that's vanadium minus two equals plus two. So vanadium equals plus four. So definitely our manganese has our highest oxidation state. Remember, oxygen is always minus two. Halogens, so chlorine, fluorine, bromine, etc., those are always minus one. And if there's hydrogen in there, hydrogen is always plus one. So in this question, we've been asked how transition metals can act as catalysts. So even though you've shown organic molecules, it's asking about how the transition metals can act as catalysts. Now, catalysts, remember, you can have your homogeneous or your heterogeneous catalysts. In this one, palladium is a solid, so this is going to be a heterogeneous catalyst. Now, what helps a catalyst, I'm uh, sorry, what helps a transition metal be a catalyst is that you have got um, empty d orbitals. And so you can bond with the um, reactant. You also have. Um, the ability to uh, change or have variable oxidation state. And what that means, it can either give or accept electrons, and that can help in terms of doing catalysis. So you've got empty d orbitals, which means you can form bonds with the reactants. It would be a dative covalent bond with the reactant bonding to the metal. And because the metal is a transition metal, it's known for having variable oxidation states, which means that during the reaction, the transition metal could accept or donate electrons to the reactant molecules. So we are now into more section two type questions. So how is an emission spectrum produced? Well, there's two marks. The first thing you need to say is 
use oh, energy to excite or a better word, promote an electron to higher energy level. Then as electron falls to lower energy level, photon is released. Okay, so as the electron falls, I can't spell electron there, as the electron falls to lower energy level, photon is released. So you have to explain how you got the atom to be able to do this. So you've promoted it using energy, heat, electricity. And then as the electron falls, that is when a photon is released, which is what is the line on the emission spectrum. Why is there a series of lines at discrete wavelengths? It's because there are multiple electron or electron shell transitions. So whenever an electron is promoted, um, you don't necessarily just go to one electron shell higher and then when it falls, it falls down one. You can go from the first energy level to the fifth energy level and that fifth energy level when the electron falls, it could go to the fourth, it could go to the third, it could go to the second or all the way back to the first. Because you have multiple transitions, you will get a distinct line for every transition possible. Okay, this next question is an energy question. But you have been given nanometers and you've been asked to work it out in kilojoules per mole. Now, if you cannot remember the equation for this, you do have um, equations in the middle of page four related to energy. Now, the important thing is that this is in kilojoules per mole and that this is in nanometers. Kilojoules per mole um, is the unit we uh, use in chemistry, but the equation, which uh, because we've been given a wavelength, is going to be H, sorry, L H C over lambda. Remember, at the end, we're going to need to divide by a thousand because this works it out in joules and dividing by a thousand will turn it into kilojoules. I've included L because it is per mole and L is Avogadro's number, which if you cannot remember Avogadro's number, Avogadro's number is given to you as Avogadro's constant on page 20. The wavelength, if we're wanting to use this equation here, this must be in meters. So all we need to do to turn it into meters is 644 times 10 to the minus 9. That is how we turn nanometers into meters. And H is Planck's constant, which is also on um, page 20. So this is going to be 6.02 times 10 to the 23 multiply by 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34, multiplied by C, which is also on page 20, the speed of light, three times 10 to the eight. All of that is going to be divided by 644, multiplied by 10 to the minus nine. Now, I always recommend that you do the top part first and then do your division because you should remember that those three numbers always give you the same answer. So 6.02 times 10 to the 23 multiplied by 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 multiplied by 3 times 10 to the 8 gets you 0 0.119738.
that number should be familiar to you. Now when we divide that by our six, sorry, I don't know why I put a point in there, just 644. That gets us 185928 joules. And remember, we divide by a thousand, which gets us 186 round it up to the nearest whole number because we had whole number there, kilojoules per mole, and that is our answer. So always remember with questions like these, one mark is usually given for writing out the equation you're going to use, then one mark for filling in the numbers correctly. To get it in kilojoules, you're going to have to divide it by a thousand at the end, and you're going to need to turn your nanometers into meters. And all you need to do is multiply it by 10 to the power of negative 9. Another question about oxidation number here. So VO2, there's no charge, so our vanadium plus 2 oxygen is 0. Oxygen is always minus 2, so our vanadium minus 4 is going to be zero, so our vanadium is four. Using orbital box notation, write down the electron configuration in terms of S, P, and D orbitals for the vanadium ion in VO4. So orbital box notation is drawing out the boxes. I would turn to your electron configuration page, page 8 of your data booklet whenever you're doing this. Now we know that vanadium has an oxidation state, so it's vanadium plus 4. Other thing to remember is that the 4s electrons go first. So in that row, vanadium is the fifth element along in the third period. We are going to take away the 4s electrons first, leaving us three electrons in the 3d orbital. And when we take away our second two electrons, that means we are going to be d1, 3d1 for that. Now, it says in terms of s, p and d orbitals. So we're going to draw them all out. So 1s. 2s. Now 2p, draw them all together. 2p, um, we've got our 3s, then we've got our 3p, we've got our 4s, which is empty, and our 3d. Now, even though we're not going to use all the orbitals, we've got to remember that there are 5d orbitals. Uh, 3, wow, 3d. Now, all the orbitals up here are filled. And I'm being careful when I'm doing this to follow Hunt's rule whenever I'm filling these. So fill them singly first, then pair them up also filling them in order of increasing energy by the alpha principle. And our 4s is empty, and then we have our 1, 3d um, electron. Okay, as you can see, it does not need to be neat, just needs to be clear. And you're using half-headed arrows or single-headed arrows, as we would call them in order to fill in the electrons. Opposite spins. So the Athwell principle, we've already um, gone over this, but this is um, that orbitals are filled in order of increasing energy. That is the alpha principle. 
Okay, now, this question is a pretty hard question. Cobalt can bind to different ligands to form octahedral complexes where the d orbitals are split into higher and lower energies. So this is whenever you're going from your phi that are all degenerate as a free ion and it goes to your two at the top and your three as a transition metal complex. So it's asking you to explain why this is happening. So remember, what's happened here is this now has ligands. And the ligands are forming date of covalent bonds. They are pointing electrons towards um, the transition metal and they're donating them. The electrons that are already in the d orbitals are going to be repelled by those electrons and when you get repulsion between electrons that is where you get an increase in energy. So what is happening is that electrons in the ligands are repelling electrons in the d orbitals. Different orbitals are different electrons will be repelled um, to different degrees depending on the orbital that they're in. Sorry, depending on the orbital they are in. So the most important part is electrons in the ligands will be repelling the electrons in the d orbitals. Repulsion is always between electrons. It causes the orbitals um, to go higher in energy because it's the electrons in those orbitals that are being repelled. These two orbitals that go really high in energy, they are uh, ones in which are, um, they're pointing directly at ligands, so they're going to get a greater degree of repulsion than the three at the bottom that are not pointing directly at ligands. But this is a very A-type question. What is causing the splitting? Electrons in the ligands are repelling electrons in the d orbitals. Right, we've got another question related to zinc, uh, sorry, related to transition metals. This one's asking us to name the zinc complex. So remember, the metal always goes at the end and we always need a Roman numeral to tell us the charge on it. And um, we've got six ligands and they're all water. So six is hexa, water we call aqua. Now this complex is positive. When a complex is positive or neutral, the metal keeps its name. So it's hexa aqua zinc, but we need Roman numerals, something in brackets to tell us the charge of the zinc. Now water has zero charge because it's neutral, which means that this plus two is all coming from the zinc. So zinc is that, that is hexa aqua zinc two. The second question is, explain why a colour of a complex zinc is, uh, sorry, why a solution of complex zinc is colourless. So remember, colour is due to D to D transitions. 
So if there's no color, um, so zinc complex must have no D to D transitions. That's a Okay, so any time a transition metal complex has no colour, it is because there are no D to D transitions. Now, why does zinc have no D to D transitions? Well, Zn2 plus, zinc is at the very end of the uh, transition metals in the first row of the transition metals. When it forms a 2 plus ion, remember it's the 4s electrons that go first. So zinc 2 plus is 3d10. All, which means all d orbitals are full. And if all the orbitals are full, you cannot get a transition. So Colour is due to D to D transitions, that's showing you understand that. So if something does, has no colour, it must not have D to D transitions. Why does it not have D to D transitions? Well, zinc 2 plus is 3D10. All of the D orbitals are full, so you cannot get a transition. Continuing on about transition metals, what is meant by a dative covalent bond? Well, this is a covalent bond. in which both of the shared electrons have come from one atom. Okay, so a covalent bond in which both of the shared electrons have come from one atom. So that was inorganic. We are now going to move on to our physical chemistry. Physical chemistry is your kinetics, it is your equilibrium, and it is your reaction feasibility. Right, which one of these would not be suitable as a buffer solution? Well, for a buffer solution, you need either a weak acid or a weak base, and a salt made from that weak acid and uh, a strong alkali, or if you were using a weak base, it needs to be a salt made from a weak base and a strong acid. So every single one of these has got um, an acid and a salt made from that acid. Now we need to work out which of these acids are weak. And to do that, look at page 14, because remember, a weak acid is going to be one of the ones found on page 14, which goes into equilibrium because it doesn't fully dissociate into its ions when it dissolves. So on page 14, boric acid is there, so that is a weak acid, so that one can be a buffer. Nitric acid is not there, so nitric acid is a strong acid and sodium nitrate, well, sodium metal always comes from, sorry, sodium ions always come from strong bases, so that was not gonna work. Benzoic acid is definitely, on page 14, it is a weak acid, as is propanoic acid. So the one that is not a suitable buffer is the one involving nitric acid. So we've got two mechanisms that have been proposed for the hydrolysis of 2-bromo-2-methylpropane. One has only one step and the other has two steps. Now the reaction is observed to follow first order kinetics. And remember the order of reaction can only be determined through experiment. And we are told that it is first order. So that has been determined. So we need to look down all of these and find out which one could be the rate mechanism. Well, rate, um, if it's first order, there's only one concentration involved. So B 
and D have two different reactants in them, so they cannot be first order. These next two, we've got our CH3A3CBR uh, and the other one we've got our CH33C+. Well, our rate has to involve a reactant. Now, our slow step is always going to be our one that determines our rate. And in this, the reactant is that. So A is going to be our answer. So that is going to be our answer A. Right, we have been given a table, because remember the experiments are what are going to determine the rate order. We've been told that the rate is K multiplied by B squared. And we've been asked to work at X. Now X is the rate. So X equals K concentration of B squared. And from the table, B is 0 0.2. But we do not know what K is. So we're going to have to work out K. So to do this, I'm going to look at experiment one, where we know that 0.05, our rate, is equal to K multiplied by B squared, which is 0.1 squared. So 0.05 equals K multiplied by, when I put in 0.1 squared, I get 0.01 0.01. So k is definitely going to be k equals 5. So I'm just going to fill that in. So 5 multiplied by 0.2 squared. And that comes out to be 0.2. Okay, so in this one you had to use experiment 1 or experiment 2 to work out what k was and then fill in the information to part uh, to experiment three to work out the rate. This next one is asking us for the units. Remember, in rate questions, if you are working out a rate, you will need to include units, um, and the units will be worth one mark in the question. My way to do this is, well, let's look at how many concentrations there are. There are three always take one away. So we're looking for something that includes two in it. Well, A doesn't, B doesn't, C doesn't, so it has to be D. So remember, normal concentration is moles per litre, but we swap them around. So moles becomes minus two and litres becomes two. And that is what we've got. Right, in this one, We've been given an equation. We've been told that the equilibrium constant is 3.9. So equilibrium constant, remember the symbol for that is a capital K and you must write it as a capital K. So K equals 3.9. We've been told that our car, we've been told the equilibrium concentration for carbon monoxide, hydrogen and water. And we've been asked to work out methane. So what we need to do is we need to write out our equilibrium expression. Now our equilibrium expression, what we do is we have our products on the top and our reactants at the bottom. So CH4 and H2O are going to go at the top. We need to look and see, are there any, so that's got a stoichiometry of one, that's got a stoichiometry of one, so we don't need any powers on this. At the bottom, we're gonna have our carbon monoxide and we're gonna have our H2. And H2 has a three there, so we need a three on the H2 whenever we're filling in our results. Now we're trying to work out CH4. So 3.9 is equal to CH4 multiplied by 4 times 10 to the minus 3 
divided by 5 times 10 to the minus 2 multiplied by 1 times 10 to the minus 2 cubed. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do everything on the right hand side. So 4 times 10 to the minus 3 divided by 5 times 10 to the minus 2 multiplied by uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 2 cubed. which equals 3.9 equals, I got 80,000 multiplied by CH4. So my CH4 is going to be 3.9 divided by my 80,000, which comes out at 4.8 Seven five times 10 to the minus 5, which is 4.9 times 10 to the minus 5, which is an answer, C. Right, next one is a buffer solution. We've got ethanoic acid and we have got sodium ethanoate, and we've been asked to work out the pH of a buffer. Now, with the pH of a buffer, we are going to be looking at page 4, for that and we've been given our acid and this is a salt. So for that pH equals pKa minus log of acid over salt. Okay, now it is ethanoic acid, so we're going to look at page 14, and the pKa of ethanoic acid is 4.76. Now that is minus the log of, and what you want to do is you want to do the division of your acid over salt first, and then work out the log of it. So your acid is 0 0.1 and your salt is 0 0.2. So that is going to be 4.76 minus the log of 0 0.5. And we do that, 4.76 minus the log of 0 0.5, we get 5.06. D. Okay? One of the most common mistakes is that people can work out the log of the acid, so log of 0 0.1, and then divide by the concentration of salt. 0 0.2. It is the log of acid over salt, not the log of acid divided by salt. It's the log of the concentration of acid divided by concentration of salt. Next question is asking you about enthalpy of formation. Now remember, enthalpy of formation is one mole being made from elements in standard state and the standard state is 298 Kelvin and one atmosphere of pressure so essentially how you would encounter the elements at room temperature so in every single one of these we're making one mole we want them being made from elements right every single one of them looks like it's being made from elements in their standard state. So this is going to be our key point, our standard state. Well, chlorine is Cl2. So that one, not right. Magnesium is a solid, oxygen is a gas, and it's O2. That's fine. 
Oh, which one cannot? Oh, sorry, answer is A. Because all the others have everything in the correct state. <coughs> Chlorine should be Cl2. So our answer is A. And that just shows you the importance of reading the question, because I would have got that wrong if I hadn't reread the question. This question is a reaction feasibility one, and it's a very common type of one that you'd almost be guaranteed. You'll be given a table of results, which will include either your enthalpies of formation, your entropy values, or it might, as in this case, include free energy values. And there will typically be three questions asking you to calculate the enthalpy change, the entropy change, and then something to do with a temperature at which the reaction becomes feasible or stops being feasible. This first question is asking you to work out the standard enthalpy change for the reaction. Now, enthalpy change, oh, something's going wrong here. Uh, H is your products minus reactants. And in this case, You've got to always be careful of the stoichiometry, but in this case, everything is in a one-to-one -one ratio. So our product is negative 6.99 and a reactant is 119. There is no enthalpy of formation for hydrogen because it is an element. Whenever we do that, what we get is, sorry, my computer is being a bit weird. What we get is negative 1 to 5.99, which I'm going to round up to negative 1 to 6. And the units are given to us in kilojoules per mole. For the next question, I'm going to actually keep a note of that, that delta H was negative 126. So that moving forward, I can use that. And then this question, I've been asked to work out the entropy change but no units have been given. Now in the question, in the table, we've been given delta H and delta G. So at some point we're probably going to, in order to work out delta S, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. That is our equation. Now we know, uh, we don't know delta G right now, but we know that delta H was negative 126. Because these are standard conditions, we know that our temperature is 298. Sorry, that's a negative sign. Delta S. Um, so because it's standard conditions, we know that the temperature is, negative, is 298. So using our table, we should be able to work out delta G. Now this is from page four. Delta G, just like for delta H and delta S, we can do the sum of products minus sum of reactants, which is 65.9 minus 185, which when we do that, um, 65, <coughs> comes out 119.1. So 119.1. So I'm going to fill that into the equation. Negative 119.1 is equal to negative 126 minus 298 delta S. So I'm going to take my 298 delta S over here, and that's going to be um, 100 minus 126 plus 119. So 126 which is 6.9. Negative. So that means delta S is going to be negative 6.9 divided by my 298, which equals 0 0.0 
two, three, one. Now there was no units given in the question, so I need to provide units. Based on this and the fact that delta G and delta H were both in kilojoules per mole, the units here are going to be in kilojoules per mole um, per Kelvin. For that, that is not the standard unit. It's usually in, in joules per mole. So if you do want to turn it into joules rather than kilojoules, you multiply by a thousand, which would be 23.1. But because no units were provided, you do need to put them in yourself. That was 23.1. Now in this one, um, we're working out the temperature at which reaction becomes feasible. So at the point of feasibility, delta G equals zero. So that means whenever we are writing our equation, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, that is zero. So delta H equals T delta S. Now from our previous questions, we know that our delta H negative one to six equals T and delta S, if we're gonna use delta H and delta S, we need it in the kilojoules form. So it's gonna be negative, negative 0 0.0231. So our temperature is going to be 126 divided by 0 0.0231, which is going to be quite a high temperature. Five thousand four hundred and fifty-four. Now, depending on the level of rounding you did. Your answer could be anywhere between 5,400 and 5,500, provided you have written down which specific numbers you're putting in and you've shown your rounding. You should not lose marks for follow through marks unless you've over rounded throughout all the different questions. In this question, we have been told that. Another preservative, so sodium 4 hydroxybenzoate has been made by refluxing ethyl paraben sodium hydroxide solution. And so this is your salt here. You've been asked to work out why, or explain, sorry, why the sodium 4 benzoate salt has a pH greater than seven. So what you should be able to always remember is that if the pH is greater than seven, it means it is an alkali. And if it is an alkali, that means you have an excess of OH minus ions. That's going to give you your one mark answer. That's what having a pH greater than 7 is an alkali, so it has an excess of hydroxide ions. Now, what we need to think about is how do we get the hydroxide ions? Now, when we're getting hydroxide, we are always going from water. That's always what's happening. Now, the only thing we've got is the thing I've underlined at the top. The sodium ion's not going to do anything with water, so it must be this other thing here. which is doing it. Now, anything happening in water is always in equilibrium. We are getting hydroxide ions because we've said that. So what has happened to go from water to hydroxide? It's lost a hydrogen, which means this molecule here must have gained a hydrogen. And here is the only place that can happen. So if I draw that in like that, That equilibrium shows that I understand what's going on, that that conjugate acid is accepting a hydrogen from, sorry, that conjugate base is accepting a hydrogen from water to create hydroxide and produce the acid. 
one mark just for explaining that if you are a conjugate acid, you have an excess of hydroxide ions. Second mark for explaining where they come from, and an equation as drawn there illustrates that. Right, in this next um, question, we've got some rate data. So determine the order of reaction. So when we're looking at the order of reaction, we're looking for experiments in which that particular chemical concentration has changed, but the other one has not. For your CH3, CHI, CH2, it is experiment one and three, that's changed. And if we look at what's happened to the rate, um, we've tripled this and we've tripled this. So if they're doing the exact same thing, that must be first order. Now for the hydroxide, it's slightly different because there are no two experiments where we change the concentration of hydroxide, but do not change the concentration of that first chemical. But if we look at one and two, We've doubled the first chemical, and what's happened to the rate is that it has doubled, which is what we would expect because that first chemical was first order. What that means is that this has had no effect, no effect whatsoever. So that is zero order. What we need to do now is write a rate equation. Now remember with a rate equation, we have to start with the word rate and then a small k. I do apologize, the pen I'm having to write with is not drawing very well. A small k and it's first order with respect to that first chemical. So open our bracket and that's going to be CH3, CHI, C2H5, and that's it. The last question here is asked us to work out the rate constant, including units. Well, I'm going to deal with the units first. I've got one concentration. If I take away one, that means I've got zero concentrations. So I don't have any moles or liters in my um, units, which just leaves me with seconds to the minus one. When it comes to calculating my value, well, rate is equal to K, and then my concentration of, I'm just gonna call it X. I'm gonna pick experiment one. So 1 1.4 times 10 to the minus four equals rate multiplied by 0 0.1. So my rate constant is going to be my 1.4 times 10 to the minus 4 divided by 0 0.1, which is 1.4 times 10 to the minus 3, and my units for seconds to the minus 1. So that is that question done. My next question here has asked me to use my information to draw a curly arrow mechanism. So what we had was CH3, C H I C two H five plus hydroxide going to C H three C H O H C two H five plus I minus. So that is a substitution reaction. And we knew it was first order, which means is SN1. So we need to draw out our mechanism. So starting, what we have is I'm going to draw out my carbon and I'm going to draw out my halogen pointing in one direction. I'm going to put my CH3, my H, and my C2H5 there. The first step I'll draw in red is the bond breaks between the carbon and the hydrogen. And what we're going to form is our intermediate. Now our intermediate is a carbocation. 
Remember, it is trigonal planar. And that is its shape. I will also have an I minus iron. Now, what's happening next is a hydroxide, which remember has a lone pair of electrons. They're going to come in and they're going to attack the carbon. Now, that can happen on either side of the molecule. So at the end, you're going to go back to being tetrahedral. And that's you. So the halogen comes off, forms a carbocation. Remember that carbocation is being stabilized by those carbon chains, which can donate electron density, that um, inductive effect. And then your nucleophile comes in, attacks the carbon and reforms the bond. Next question, what is meant by a weak acid? Well, a weak acid is an acid that partially dissociates into ions when it dissolves. in water. Remember that it's happening when it dissolves in water. If you just wrote the first part that it partially dissociates into ions, you would not get the mark. It partially dissociates into ions when it dissolves in water. The next question, we've got hydrofluoric acid and we've been given a concentration we can ask to work out its pH and it is a weak acid. So the calculation we are using is that pH equals half pKa minus a half log of acid. Oh no, half log C. I don't know why, where I was getting that from. Half log C. So what I like to do is I don't like to deal with the halves. So I multiply both sides by two. So I get two pH equals pKa minus log of C, which in this case was 3.75, and my pKa for hydrofluoric acid from page 14 is 3.2. When I do that, 3.2 minus the log of 3.75, that equals 2.626, or 2.62. And it's 2.626. And that was 2 pH, so I'm going to divide by 2, which gets me 3.1, uh, sorry, 1.3 pKa. Sorry, that's my pH. This next question is describe a relationship between the number of chlorine atoms and the strength of the acid. OK, so the relationship needs to mention the term, the number of chlorine atoms and the strength of the acid. This table does show us enough information to talk about the number of chlorine atoms. But it's given us Ka. Ka on its own, if we talk about Ka, we're not talking about the strength of the acid. We need to understand how Ka relates to the strength of the acid to make a conclusion. Now what we can see with the chlorines, as we go down this table, we are getting more chlorine. As we go down the table, our Ka is increasing. Now, as Ka increases, that means acidity is increasing because Ka is related directly to acidity. 
So as we go down the table, Ka is increasing, so acidity is increasing, which means our conclusion would be as number of chlorine increases, the strength of acid increases. And that would be our conclusion. So we're now on to the organic section, which is um, the section in which you can expect the majority of your questions. And there is quite a lot. I've tried to pick um, a wider range of questions as I could, but this is not exhaustive. So first question, which one of these will react with ethanol to produce ethoxide? Now, ethoxide is an alcoholic alkoxide, or it is an alkoxide. How we make alkoxides is reacting with them with sodium or potassium. So that's what you need to know. If you want to make an alkoxide, you react in alcohol with sodium or potassium. This next question. We've got two chemicals, we've got lycopene and we've got beta carotene. So I'm just going to call them L and B. So lycopene is red and beta carotene is orange. And that's the colours that they are. So we can look at the colours they absorb using page 19 and the colour wheel. So if it's red, it's absorbing blue-green. Which is 490 to 500. And the orange one is when it absorbs its green and blue, which is 480 to 490 nanometers. Now we've been given these statements. What can we say about the HOMO and LUMO gap? Well, if something's colored, you're the light that is being absorbed is causing a transition from the HOMO to the LUMO. So, not affected, no colour is always affected by the homo lumo gap. Beta carotene has the same energy as homo lumo. No, that one can't be correct because they're different colours. So, we're just needing to work out which one has got the bigger energy gap or the higher energy gap. Now, these numbers are your wavelengths. Uh, and Energy equals HC over lambda. So energy increases as lambda decreases. So whichever one has the smallest lambda will have the higher energy gap. And the beta carotene one has the smaller wavelength, so it's going to have a higher energy gap. So beta carotene is a higher energy gap. That is our correct answer. Okay, so look, whatever colour they are, they absorb the opposite colour. Racemic mixture. Well, the racemic mixture is when you have a mixture of two enantiomers. So remember, enantiomers are non superimposable mirror images and they occur whenever you have carbon atoms that have four different groups coming out of them. The other word, geometric isomers, that applies to whenever you've got restricted rotation, such as in an, an alkene, a double bond, and you have two different groups either being on the same or opposite side of the double bond. Which of the following analytical techniques depends on the vibrations within molecules? Well, vibration is always infrared. When 
a molecule absorbs infrared, it causes a bond to vibrate. Every type of bond will vibrate at a different frequency, so we'll absorb a different infrared spectrum. This one is about infrared, and it's asking us which spectrum would not have a significant peak. The spectrum we just would not have a peak in which one of those ranges. So what we're needing to do is we're needing to look at our page of infrared signals, and our infrared is on page 15. So what we need to do is look at each of those numbers, identify the bond that it says is there, that would be that frequency, sorry, would that be that range of wave numbers? And if the molecule has that bond, we would expect to see a peak there. If the molecule does not have that type of bond, then that's going to be our answer. So 1,700 to 1,680, that is a carbon-oxygen stretch. This has in it a carbon-oxygen, so that one is not going to be our answer. 2962 to 2853. Well, that is an alkane, a carbon hydrogen stretch. Well, we've got plenty of those. There's one there, so it's not going to be that one. 3100 to 3000, uh, to 3000, sorry. That is a benzene ring. This is not a benzene ring, so that is our answer. Let's just double check the bottom one. 3500 to 3300, that is an NH stretch, which we have in here. So our answer is C, and I don't know why my pen changed colour during that. Next question. Antisense drugs are a group of medicines that act by binding to DNA to block the synthesis of some proteins. What line describes the correct things for our antisense drugs? Well, they are blocking the synthesis, so they are working against something, so they are going to be an antagonist. So because they are an antagonist, cannot be C or D. Now the antisense, they bind to DNA to block it. So the receptor is the thing that it binds to. So the thing it's binding to is the DNA. So our answer is A. Right, this is a question with a lot of information on it. Propan 1 all through reaction 1 can go to 1 chloropropane. And we can turn 1 chloropropane into methoxypropane and into propane. So we're identifying the type of reaction. So propan-1-ol, well that is an alcohol. So that's going to have a hydroxyl group on it. One chloropropane is going to have a Cl group on it. So we have switched the group, so it's going to be a substitution reaction. Now let's look at reaction number two. Chloropropane to propane. So that is going from a, that to a haloalkane to an alkene. That is elimination. So it looks like A is going to be our answer, but let's just check whether the third reaction agrees. And going from chloropropane to methoxy, that is an ether. Remember, it's got that oxy in the middle, it's an ether. That is changing the functional grip, switching it, so that is a substitution reaction. So our answer is definitely A. Right, in this one, we've been asked, what is the least likely one to occur? So that first one, we're adding on a halogen using aluminium chloride as a catalyst. That's going to work. This second one, um, when we want to add on bromine, we do an electrophilic substitution. When bromine reacts with light, what happens is that you get your bromine radicals forming that way, and bromine radicals are not electrophilic, they're nucleophilic. 
because they're looking for electrons. Uh, sorry, they're not going to do electrophilic substitution. Um, they're going to be they're going to do nucleophilic substitutions. That one's not going to work. In this one, well, we're adding the bromine onto an alkane and a radical will do that reaction. That's from higher. So that reaction will occur. And the bottom one, well, sulfuric acid and um, SO3 is a way of adding that on that will produce that one. So the answer to this one is B. You cannot use radicals to do an electrophilic substitution. And whenever you react a halogen with light, that is when you're making radicals. Okay, this one is to do with NMR. Of the splitting patterns seen in the high resolution NMR, um, um, sorry, one of them is that, um, and it's asking which one of them, is it H, A, H, B, H, C, or H, D, is going to be the one that's got that. Now this, we've got three signals, so that's a triplet, and in NMR we've got our N plus one rule. So if we've got three signals here, that means it's got two hydrogen neighbours. Which one has two hydrogen neighbours? Well, this hydrogen, you ignore the, car, the hydrogens that are on the same carbon. This one's only got one neighbour. This one here has got... So that one's only got one neighbour. This one's got three and two, so that's when we've got five. These ones here have got two here and one here, so that's three. And this one here has only got those two. So we were looking for the one with two, which is D. Which one would have an enantiomer? So remember, enantiomer is the same as an optical isomer. We must have a chiral centre which means one carbon for different groups. So in that top one, we've got two hydrogens, so no. On this one, we've got four different groups, so that makes sense. On number C, we've got a CH3 and a CH3, so those are two of the same group. And on D, we've got a hydrogen and a hydrogen, so it's not that one, so it's B. Enantiomer, We'll have a chiral centre, and antimer is also an optical isomer. Which one has geometric isomer? So geometric isomer, you need restricted bond rotation. Which you either get by having a double bond, or by being on a ring. So these ones here at the top do not have that. You also need two groups on opposite carbon atoms. So you need the same group on each of the carbon atoms that are part of the bond with restricted rotation. So in number C, sorry, in, in C, the two chlorines are on the same carbon. So they're not on opposite carbon atoms. So that one's not gonna work. On this one, we've got chlorine and chlorine, or we could also have done our hydrogen and hydrogen, two groups on uh, opposite carbons. And this one specifically, that's going to be our trans isomer because they are on opposite sides. So we need restricted rotation and we need two of the same group on each of the carbon atoms. Right, this next question is a microanalysis question and you would need your calculator for this. So whenever you're doing this, remember what you do is you take your carbon, your hydrogen and your oxygen, you write down the percentage 
and then you divide by the GFM, or the, sorry, the relative atomic mass. So that's going to be 12, 1, and 16. So 80 divided by 12 is 6.67. Nine point three is going to be that one, and ten point seven divided by sixteen equals zero point six seven. Now, what we do is we look at the one which is the smallest, and we divide by whichever value is the smallest. And we round it up to the nearest whole number. So when I do that one, I get 9.9 .9 something. So that's going to be 10. I round this one up. That gives me 13.9. So that's going to be 14. And that one's going to be 1. So I've got 10 carbon. I've got 14 hydrogen and 1 oxygen, which is A. Right. Reaction of two, I get cis but two in. So but two in is C four H eight. I want the skeletal structure, and it is cis. So if you want to, what you can do is you can draw it out in your normal bonds, and it's but two in. So we're going to have a double bond here. And then H, 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 and then turn that into a skeletal formula. So in a skeletal formula, remember, you don't have any hydrogens. So that is it. One, two, three, four carbons, and it's cis because the two CH3 groups are on the same side of the double bond. Um, why does but1ene have no geometric isomers? Well, but1ene Well, because one carbon on the carbon carbon removal bond has two, two H atoms, same group, cannot be cis or trans. Okay, because here it doesn't matter whatever way you do them, they're going to have the same group. So it has two hydrogen atoms, so the same groups cannot be cis trans. Okay, so we've got two molecules that are dyed. What is responsible for the colour? So remember, it is your, well actually on these ones, it's the whole thing. Alternating single double ones. So what that would be called is a chromophore, but the word chromophore does not ever get you a mark. So what you're looking for is that alternating sequence is called a conjugated system or alternating double single bonds. Explain how colour arises in these dye molecules. Well, conjugation 
lures homulamugab. The molecule absorbs visible light to promote electron from homo to lumo. And I'm going to put an asterisk. Molecule appears the complementary color. Okay, so conjugation lowers the homo lumo gap so that visible light will be absorbed and you'll promote an electron or excite an electron from the homo to the lumo and the molecule will appear the complementary color of light. So this question is an entire question where we're doing the structural determination. So looking at a few different methods and using the information we get to work out the structure of a molecule. So in this question, we are working out our empirical formula. So just like before in that previous question, what we need to do is take our percentages and divide each one by the relative atomic mass. So that's 12 for carbon, one for hydrogen and 16 for oxygen. Now when we do that, uh, 50 divided by 12 is 4.17. That's obviously still 5.6 and 44.4 divided by 16 is 2.8. We divide through by our smallest one, which is 2.8. Our carbon and 4.17 divided by 2.8. So we get 1.5. We get 2 and we get 1. Now we cannot have 1.5 as our number. So what we're going to do is multiply everything by 2 so that we have whole numbers. So that would be 3, 4, and 2, which gives us our empirical formula as 3, 3, H, 4, O, 2. In our next question, it is infrared, so you're looking at page 100, page 15, and um, so page 15. Now we were looking for a peak at 1710. So at 1710, there are two possible groups it fits into. So we have got 1740 to 1700 and 17. Um, two five to one seven zero zero. Both of those are C double bond O stretches, and that's what that's all that's looking for. It's a C double bond O stretch, and it could either be an aldehyde, ketone, or a carboxylic acid. So an aldehyde ketone or carboxylic acid. The fact that it has two oxygens in it would probably lead me to believe it's a carboxylic acid, but we do not definitely know. What we know is that it does contain a carbon-oxygen uh, double bond. So in this question, what we've been given is a mass spectrum, and I've circled the heaviest peak, because remember that is your molecular ion. And it tells you your GFM. So our GFM is 72. Now at this stage, if we're working out our molecular formula, we use our empirical formula and just see what is the mass of it and then how many times does it go into your GFM. Now it was C3H4O2. 
which is 3 times 12, 6 times 1, 2 times 16, so 36, 6 and 32, which is adding up to 72. So because those agree, our molecular formula must be the same. Ugh. H4O2. Now what we've got is a peak at 27. And we have to work out what could be the fragment responsible for it. Now the most important thing to remember is in mass spec, our fragments are always positively charged and we put them inside a bracket because we fire electrons at them, which knocks out other electrons to create positive charges. Now, our formula has three carbons, four oxygens, and two, uh, sorry, two oxygens and four hydrogens. If this fragment contained an oxygen, that would take 16 away, which would leave us with 11. Now, carbon is 12, so we would have to have um, 11 hydrogens to make this up. So that means we have no, no oxygen because this doesn't work. We had 11 left. So if our 27, let's take away a carbon, that would give us 15. Let's take away another carbon, uh, take away 12, which is three. So we've got a carbon, a carbon, and three hydrogens. So it looks like it's going to be C2H3, which means somewhere in our molecule, we've got two carbons connected to three hydrogens that all exist together and could be knocked off. So we've got two carbons and three hydrogens together. So let's think. So we know we've got somewhere we've got a C2H3. We know from the infrared we've got that. And our, we know our overall formula is C2H, sorry, C3H4O2. So if we take away this, this fragment from this, if we take away our C2H3, because it all has to be joined together, that leaves us with CO, no, sorry, HCO2. Remember from our IR, this could have been an aldehyde, a ketone, or a carboxylic acid. This is C2OH, so that looks like it's a carboxyl group. And then the rest of the molecule would be your C2H3. So let's draw out our carboxylic acid. Okay, now we need another two carbons. And we've got to fit three hydrogens around this somehow. So the only way that's going to happen, if we put two hydrogens on this carbon, we would need another three hydrogens for that carbon. So that can't be right. There can't be that. There can't be two hydrogens on this carbon. So let's make one of these a double bond because that's a way of easing it out. That means we can put one hydrogen on here. We do that. And then we will put other two hydrogens on here. That's one, two, three carbons. One, two, three, four hydrogens. So one, two, three carbons. One, two, three, four hydrogens. One, two oxygens. We definitely have a C2H3 fragment. We also, we have our CO2 here. So yeah, that makes sense. So we're going to treat that as our final molecule. So carbon, carbon, double bond with then a carboxyl group coming off of it. And that is our structure. So it does take some work just to get used to it. 
And don't ever underestimate the fact that the SQA can give you double bonds in molecules to deal with. Right, the next set of questions are going to be based around this um, mind, uh, this uh, synthesis map. So the first question is, draw compound X. So what we've got here is we have got an alkene and we've got HBr. So an alkene, we've got HBr, and it can form two different products. Now, we've got to think, HBr, we can form two different products. It is an alkene, and we're going to something that is a haloalkene. This is an addition reaction. And because this has got two different groups on it, we can add on, looks like we've added the hydrogen on there, we can add them in the other way. So X is going to be so make sure we still have our CH3 there and we're going to have our bromine on there. That's what X is. And that's going to have something to do with Markovnikov's rule. So you can see this one here, the bromine's added onto the carbon with the CH3, the hydrogen's added onto the carbon that already had a hydrogen on it. So that one is probably our major one, and this one's our minor one because we've had the hydrogen added onto the other. Calculate the GFM of this. So GFM, how many carbons have we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. How many hydrogens have we got? Now I'll use a different colour. So we've got three hydrogens here. We've got another one here. One. We've got two, 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 two. This one, we've got one hydrogen on. So that's two, four, six, eight, plus the two here, which is 13. And then we have got our bromine. Yep, so our GFM is going to be 7 times 12, so 84, and plus 13, plus our atomic mass of bromine, which is going to be somewhere near 80. Bromine is 79.9. So add those two together, plus 13 plus 3. There's 176.9. You need to be able to, from a skeletal formula, work out a GFM. Remember, rings like this, there are two hydrogens, so rings like this, two hydrogens on every corner. If it's a benzene, there's only one hydrogen on every corner. So really be careful. Ah, reaction one obeys Markovnikov's rule. Explain why compound X is the minor product. So Markovnikov's rule. Hydrogen adds onto a carbon with most hydrogens already. Why? Most stable carbocation. Well, give major product. So stating Markovnikov's rule, now stating it 
it's not enough. You need to actually be able to say, why does it do? So the hydrogen will add onto the carbon with the most hydrogen already on it. Why does it do that? Because that gives the most stable carbocation. So in this one, you've got two possibilities. You could form a carbocation there, or you could form, if you're going to do the other one, where the bromine adds on to this one, this one, more carbon chains to donate And this uh, one on the right has fewer so this one is more stable one on the left is more stable that one is less stable Okay, so the Rakovnikov rule states that hydrogen adds on to the carbon with most hydrogens already on it because that gives the more stable carbocation. I've drawn out the two possible carbocations you could get and explained why the one which leads to X is less stable because there are fewer carbon chains which can donate to the carbocation. That donation is the inductive effect. Right. Suggest a reagent. So this, we are going from C, triple bond N, to COOH. That is acid hydrolysis. You just need to be able to recognise that. An acid hydrolysis would be something like HCl, and it needs to be aqueous. So you must, 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 must be dissolved because it is hydrolysis so you need water in there you could either write acid dissolved in water or put the aq state symbol name compound y now in this question you were given the naming of this system so you told this was carbon number one because that's where the branch is one methyl the ring was cyclohexane because of the double bond You've not got that, so this molecule is going to be cyclohexane. We have got, we've still got our methyl group. One methyl. But we've now also got that group, which you need to be able to recognise is a methoxy group. And it is also on carbon number one. So that is one methyl, one methoxy cyclohexane. It doesn't matter which one of those you put in which order. Technically, it should be methoxy first because methoxy is first alphabetically. But one methyl, one methoxyhexane, or one methoxy, one methyl cyclohexane. That is just following the rules um, of naming systems. Right, in this one, we are going from a haloalkane to an alkene. And we're using ethanolic potassium hydroxide, that is elimination. Okay, we've been asked to draw Curly arrow for the production of butantool. So firstly, which one of these is butantool? That is our butantool. So what we've got here, I'm going to shorten this. So I'm going to do a C, double bond C, H, 
H and I'm going to write H five C two and our H here. Now we are using our a, a water and acid. So I'm going to draw it out as a hydronium ion. Now the first stage in elimination, uh, this is not elimination, sorry. This is an addition reaction. This is hydration. Is the double bond will attack the hydrogen and the hydrogen oxygen bond goes back onto that. What that gives us is, and we're making the butan tool, so that means the hydrogen's adding on to the right hand carbon. That's where our hydrogen's going, that was where our hydroxide is going. So, sorry, I'll shade it in green. So we've added on that hydrogen. Oh, our double bond is broken, so it's only one bond there. Um, what we've got is we've got our H5C2, and we have got another hydrogen. And that is our carbocation. And it's going to form that one as our major product because this is the more stable carbocation. If we added the hydrogen onto the left-hand carbon and had the positive charge on the right-hand one, there would not be as much inductive effect from groups stabilizing the carbocation. We have our water molecule still though. And our water molecule is going to come in and it's going to go to the carbon. So what we're going to have now is carbon, carbon, Now this isn't good because this oxygen now has three bonds and it's positive. So what comes along is another water molecule. Which accepts a proton. And what happens is we produce our final molecule here. And we also regenerate our H3O plus from this blue water molecule. So the double bond attacks, attacks your H plus or your H3O plus ion, forming a carbocation. Remember to form the most stable carbocation. Your water comes in and attacks the carbocation. And then you need to remove a proton from the water molecule. You must remember that when an oxygen has three bonds, we give the oxygen a positive charge. Right, in this one, we've been asked to draw SN2 substitution. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw it with the chlorine pointing here. I'm gonna draw C2H5. I'm going to have hydrogen and my CH3. And what is coming in is hydroxide. Now, hydroxide is going to come in from the opposite side. And what we're going to make is we're going to make a really long intermediate where it is trigonal bipyramidal. So we have our H, O, our dashed bonds,
and this has a total negative charge on it. And what happens is then we have the chlorine come off, which gives us our plus our Cl minus. So it's really important that you've got the nucleophile that's come in and your halogen that's leaving on opposite sides with partial bonds and the other three in a triangle. And you must show an arrow breaking the carbon halogen bond in SN2. And it's really, 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 really important that if the chlorine, if the halogen was pointing to the right hand side, that your new nucleophile is pointed to the left hand side because we get an inversion. Which means if we started with one chiral centre, the chiral centre would have inverted to the opposite chiral centre by the end. Final section we've got, and there's very few questions here, is problem solving and some experimental questions. I'm pretty sure most of these are problem solving. So this question is a type of question that they really like in advanced time. Um, so there's a few things to note. The term PPM means parts per million. And all that means is when you're using that number, you take whatever value it was, 0 0.03, and just divide by a million. So every time it's 0 0.3 parts per million, that just means multiply by 0 0.03 and then divide by a million. The other important thing to note is when they're talking about air, litres of air, one litre of air, is one kilogram and one centimeter cubed of air is one gram. Okay, I don't know why they expect you to just know that, but they do. Okay, so in this question, we were told six liters per air um, containing 0 0.03 parts per million of hydrogen sulfide what mass of hydrogen sulfide is inhaled in six minutes? So uh, one minute was six litres. So 10 minutes is going to be 60 litres, which is 60 kilograms. Now, all of these answers are in grams or milligrams, so I'm going to turn this into grams. So just multiply by 1,000. 60,000 grams and we're told it's 0 0.3 parts per million so I'm just going to take my 60,000 and multiply it by my 0 0.03 divided by a million. When I do that I get um, Uh, 0.0018 grams, which if I turn it into milligrams by multiplying by a thousand, is 1.8 milligrams, which is my answer. So just be careful, as they're talking about air, treat one litre as being one kilogram and one centimetre cubed as being one gram. Right here we've got a question about percentage yield. In this experiment, the percentage yield was 77.5. Um, calculate the mass of ethyl paraben, which is this thing, required to produce 2.48. Now that produce, that is your actual yield. So 
So at the front of your data booklet, in case you forget, percentage yield is equal to your actual divided by your theoretical multiply by 1000. Okay, now 77.5 7 is equal to your actual yield, which was 2.48. Divided by your theoretical yield multiplied by 100. So rearranging that, your theoretical yield is going to be your 2.48 divided by your percentage yield multiplied by 100. Two point four eight divided by seven point five equals multiply by so that's three point two grams. So that we should make three point two grams of this. Divide by one hundred and thirty eight is zero point zero. 0 0.0232 moles. It's a one to one ratio, so 0 0.0232 moles of this multiplied by my 166. I've just kept the number in my calculator for um, that, so it's 2 point, uh, 0 0.023188, etc. which gets me 3.5 grams. Sorry, 3.85 grams. So in this final question, it is just another case of using parts per million. Um, this question, even though it's worth two marks, is actually one of the easiest questions you could get asked. You're told that a sword has a mass of 1,300 grams and that the vanadium concentration is 71 ppm. How much vanadium is that? Well, all you need to do for this question is take your 1,300 grams and multiply it by 71 divided by a million. And that is all there is to it. So 1,300 0, 0, multiplied by 71 and divided by which is 0 0.0923 grams, which um, is going to be the same as 92 milligrams. And that is it. So I know this video was long. I hope you have watched it in sections. Um, but it does cover a lot of the skills necessary. As I said, no open-ended questions, but you will be given an open-ended booklet um, to try and make sure you bring that in and we can get it marked.